I paint flowers so they will not die. Artist, Rita Kahlo. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Jeffrey T. Larson's evocative paintings are stunning visual essays of beauty. His contemporary paintings are deeply rooted in academic realism. Because of the extremes and seasons in his home state of Minnesota, Jeffrey spends his time painting outdoors in its all-too-brief warm summers. His outdoor paintings glow and shimmer with the drama of light. Whether the scene is of a woman silhouetted against warm sunlight, hanging laundry to dry outdoors, or a young boy is wading through a cool, sparkling stream, your eye is drawn to the beauty of the moment captured in Jeffrey's expressive impressionistic brushwork. As the air chills and it becomes too cold to paint outdoors, Jeffrey turns to painting indoors. Carefully staged, each still life brims with quiet beauty and drama. His subject can be a rack of artisan bread loaves, or it can be an old Art Deco-style Electrolux vacuum cleaner, or a pack of clementines still in their plastic packaging, or an old child's tricycle, all rusted and worn. Meticulously painted and finished, sometimes over a period of several months, these paintings never appear stiff. They are monumental works of beauty. Jeffrey Larson was born in 1962 in Two Harbors, Minnesota, and grew up in the Twin Cities. He was trained in the manner of the old masters at the prestigious Atelier Lac, founded by artist Richard Lac. It was a place whose traditions and training methods reached back through Impressionism, and the 19th century French academies. Jeffrey's training provided a firm foundation in the fundamentals that allowed his artistic voice to flourish. The road to becoming a professional artist was not an easy one. Jeffrey is quick to acknowledge he often lived on the edge of frustration. In time, he learned to enjoy the business side of being an artist, and his success at making a living as an artist grew as he and his wife Heidi, also an artist, persevered. His story is beautifully told in filmmaker Joe Hawkins' documentary titled Jeffrey T. Larson. Jeffrey's paintings may at first invoke a sense of nostalgia in the viewer. Yet, his paintings are timeless. The subject matter at first may seem prosaic and mundane, but there is clearly much more present in the painting. Jeffrey draws you into the painting and invites you to take a closer look and observe what he has found. And as you stand there, immersed in experiencing that painting, Jeffrey T. Larson is already off on his way on another mission to finding deeper beauty. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Jeff, I really appreciate you being a part of The Artful Painter uh, podcast. This has been... Uh, something I've been looking forward to since I talked with Joe Hawkins and he revealed to me this amazing documentary about you. So uh, I, I was just blown away by your story and I just said, ah, oh, I need to talk to you and to introduce you to my audience. So I'm really happy that you're joining us today. Well, Carl, I want to thank you, and I just want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to reach out to me. I'm flattered, and I'm grateful, and uh, looking forward to this. As I was looking at your work, I saw there there seemed to be like two different personalities, and 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 the first word that came to my mind was nostalgia. But then I immediately struck that. I said, No, 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 no. That's that's not it. It's much deeper. It's much deeper than that. There's kind of a feeling of timelessness. Uh, to your paintings, whether it's an outdoor painting or an indoor painting, and uh, and then you definitely guide uh, guide my eye to see the beauty in what seems mundane. So that's my impression of your art. How where does that come from? Um, some people say schizophrenia, but I, I, I no, not really. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I have, it's nice that you said it that way. Cause you know, that's what I do hope for. Um, there's, you want to be timely. You want to be 
uh, you know, of your own time. You know, I'm, I'm a, like everyone else today, a modern man trying to interpret his world, but I'm doing it in a methodology that does harken back to, to centuries past in a sense. And then the very fact in today's world that, you know, we were painting in a representational manner. It's been, you know, the narratives created that that's all done. It's all old fashioned. It's, it's why go there, which of course I, I totally uh, disagree with. Um, but so anyway, there, it just, you know, I, when, when, you know, they say a thousand sunsets have been painted. That's true, but it hasn't been painted by me or, you know, their contemporaries. It hasn't been painted maybe in the same way in 2020 as it was in 1820. Um, and, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with looking at things that people have been looking at forever. I mean, if you look at it in a sense, you know, for the people that wonder why we do what we do, you, do they like reading novels? I mean, what do they say? There's seven storylines, you know, they, that's what everybody just repeats. And yet everybody loves to read novels or a movie is a, a realistic, you know, adaptation of life. Um, and so I kind of see that's what people in our genre are doing. So I'm trying to strike, in my mind, what I see is common to all people um, and doing it in a, in a way that is up to date. But I don't want 20 years from now people go, yeah, that was 1999. When I, re- I remember those hairstyles. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be dated at the same time. So anyway, that's what I try to I try to walk that line. Now, you, you paint both indoors and outdoors and, and the paintings, your outdoor paintings do have a very different look. From your indoor paintings. It's more um, impressionistic, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. um, and just full of gorgeous light. And and then your interior or still lives seem to be more, it, it has a more classical feel to it, but it, it feels fresh. But it but they're very different in style and look. Yeah. Um, well, part of what drove me that besides multiple interests is uh, long, cold winters. <laughs> <laughs> which drove me drives you inside. But, um, you know, it, 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 I, w- I was, I was, I was very blessed to have studied with Richard Lack at the Atelier Lack in the early eighties. And, and through that, I gained the tools and the, and the craftsmanship to, you know, to kind of go in whatever direction I felt I needed to, to maybe capture whatever inherent beauties that I see in the subject I'm looking at. So, um, the, the still lights actually start out looking Pretty much the, the lay-ins of a still life, I should say, is the same as my lay-ins for an outdoor piece. But whereas in the outdoor piece, I feel that if you really want to capture light, if that's the focus of of, of that piece, to paint details, is that doesn't help it. it. It's the broad, bold brush strokes or maybe the larger value patterns that will mimic, as I see it, outdoor light. Whereas... On an interior piece, a portrait or a still life, the beauties I see might be, you know, some small blemish on an apple or, uh, you know, the way the light goes across uh, my daughter's cheek, for instance. And in that case, I need to have a much more refined approach. So um, really, I just tailor the craft to bring out what it is that caught my eye and that I want to emphasize. You said that you studied with Richard Lack. That must have been an amazing experience. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, it was, it was such a serendipitous encounter that allowed, you know, that I even found him and the fact that he was in the twin cities of all places, you know, that in the eighties, you know, this was pre-internet. So I imagine there was more working studios, teaching studios around the world than we were aware of. But I think at that time we, we were aware of maybe seven, eight other places where you could train in the method and manners descended from the old masters. You know, for instance, well, for Lack's example, he studied with a gentleman named Ives Gamble. Gamble was born in the late 1800s. He was exceedingly wealthy, um, which allowed him to do whatever he wanted the rest of his life, which basically was fight modernism and, and fight for this 500 year Western painting tradition that he had inherited. He'd studied, I think at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts or the Julienne. And he also was a, a longtime student of, um, of Paxton, one of the Boston 10. He overlapped that amazing era of the late 19th century, early 20th century Paris 
And he went to the opera with Sargent, for example, and he was a recipient of a training that had gone from teacher to student, really from before the Renaissance. And in the course of his life, which he outlines in his book, Twilight of Painting, he saw that completely almost thrown away. So by the time I got to Lax in the 80s, the entire tradition, history of, of the training of painters that had been practiced and passed down for centuries was almost gone. Very few people had that knowledge and even fewer were, were teaching. You know, it, it, the, the painters that, you know, passed in the lost in 10 and, and an amazing number of great artists after World War One couldn't sell their work very easily. Students didn't want to train with them. They wanted to be modern. And within a generation or two, again, information is lost. So Gamble was just such a linchpin. And he was a cantankerous old man, from what I understand, and just fought everybody tooth and nail, which is what kind of personality I guess you would need to stick to his guns the way he did and Lack was fortunate to find him and um, Gam- like I said Gamble had studied with Paxton and Paxton of course had studied at the Ecole des Boards under Jerome. Paxton was an interesting gentleman where he and, and other co-patriots other expatriates I should say from America who had the classical academic education kind of like Paris stuck around got to know Monet and that group seeing what that new avant-garde movement was about uh, learned it and then came back to America and sort of formed a loose, a loose coalition they called the Boston 10 that tried to combine the, the rigors of the academic draftsmanship and composition with the beautiful impressionistic color. And that's that's how their school became known as. Uh, Jay Rome studied with Delaroque and Delaroque, you know, you can send this right back to David. So The fact that I landed in a school that was still passing on that knowledge uh, was just a a game changer for me. And what a rarity. I mean, it's like finding a gold nugget out in the middle of the wilderness. It's an amazing time. The fact that, you know, we, we were like this isolated island. And now when you see all the different ateliers and academies and phenomenal young artists who, you know, I, I look at what graduate or even senior students are doing in different academies. And I tell you to say for a, a head study that took me 10 years to do after school. I mean, the, the, the level of craftsmanship and artistry is just rising. It's like a mini little Renaissance taking place. And it's, it's a really exciting time. So you've carried on that tradition yourself by uh, forming the great lakes Academy of fine art. So you're carrying that tradition down into our day as well, giving students more opportunities to learn uh, the craft in detail, uh, which wasn't a, w- wasn't always readily available. How did that come about? Yeah, so I when I first graduated from Atelier Lac, I um I was offered a teaching position. It was a branch school in a sense that opened up in the Twin Cities called Atelier Le Soir. Who did train some wonderful painters? Um, off the top of my head, uh, Steve Levine and Paul Oxborough were students then. And um, but anyway, it was a uh, I was invited to be the assistant director and head instructor. And so I did that for a number of years, I think three or four. That's where I met my wife. And at that time then, while it was a phenomenal postgraduate training in the sense that you know, if you, there's certain things you learn, you can you can do it. It's very analogous to, to sports. You might be able to, you know, swing a tennis rack in a certain way, but until you really break it down and verbally can critique yourself and, and check your stance and to swing, and it, it's hard to critique and, and improve or, or make corrections. So, teaching for those years directly following my training forced me to re-examine and verbalize and intellectualize what I had learned and maybe had gotten somewhat accomplished at, but was still more uh, instinctual or, you know, second nature without me being in control. So if we fast forward, then when my son, uh, my eldest of three children, and uh, they're all artistic, but our, our oldest just... Um, just right away, it was Evan and had <laughs> amazing talent. Um, his mother and me are both artists. Uh, my wife's father is an uh, artist. My mom became an artist until he was, we say, condemned at birth. But he um, he ended up deciding to to go and study at the atelier. So I had always told him that, you know, you should probably do some teaching for that same reason. And, and part of what I did, too, was I had been disassociated, really, with any school for decades. I, I moved my family 
up north. We bought an old school building in the middle of nowhere on the South Shore of Lake Superior. And we just painted and lived. And um, so I reestablished contact with the atelier and they were kind enough to invite me down to, to teach once, once a month and, and, and work with, with the school and Brock was there. So I got to hang out with my kid. That's got to be a privilege right there to do that and, ha- and have a child that follows in your footsteps, as it were. It, it really, it really was, and, and, and I, some of my best memories will be when me coming down for three, four days, and us hanging out, and you know, went from father son to a little bit more, you know, co patriot, and uh, it was great. But with that too, I, I remember my first critique. So I'm, I've been painting for thirty years. I, you know, made you know full time. I remember a one man show. I mean, I, you know, I did, did okay, and I'm listening to myself give the first critique to to some advanced students, and and. I'm listening to what I'm saying. I'm thinking, this makes no sense. What am I thinking? So I, I, it, it ended up, I went back that, you know, for that next month, I'm like, well, what, it, that doesn't make sense. That's totally not a efficient way to go about this. And I would think through well, what would be. So over the course of the next four or five years, when I would do that, uh, when Brock was down for five years, I re-examined everything I did completely changed how I painted or made it more efficient. A, a painting that would take six months by the end of that time would take two. I think it turned out much better. And so and during that time, I just realized that the, the teaching is just a vital part of growing no matter what stage you're in. So Brock at that time was offered a, he started teaching and, and then was offered an amazing position at the school. I was offered a position over in Europe to come and help with the school. And we just kind of thought, you know, why, why don't we just do it together our way? And so that's that was the genesis of, of the Great Lakes Academy. Very nice. Now, you intrigued me with uh, your your struggle with codifying what a critique is, how to go about it. And so I'm 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 curious, how what did you discover about what makes an effective critique? Well, the tradition I came out of with Richard Lack, uh, you know, he basically, they, him and Steve, they just told you what you did wrong. <laughs> you know, basically, once you put the mark down on the paper or painting, the attitude we he, they said to bring to this was, now you need to correct that. And there's reasons for that. One, we all have a predisposed idea of what we're looking at. And what we're looking at really isn't honestly true, not from the visual standpoint. And how I describe it to my students is that we kind of characterize things. Um, and just like a good character artist will capture the likeness of somebody, you know, be like, yeah, that looks just like Joe. Yeah, but does Joe really have ears the size of elephants and a big nose and, you know, squinty eyes? And we recognize things and, 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 but not accurately. And so the spiel that I kind of go to is that, you know, we we basically, our eyes are hit with, you know, millions of bits of information of, of the photons. We disregard 99% of it. And what we retain and analyze or filter primarily is that that helps us navigate, how to walk from A to B, how to pick something up. Is it hard? Is it soft? Is it, you know, in that kind of realm. And it's not, is it light? Is it dark? Is it hard? You know, it's, we don't look at it from a visual standpoint. We create characters so we can function. So the big part of the atelier training was not how to paint, but how to see. And so then yeah, what, what, over the course of, the, of my painting and then of teaching and then trying to form our school, I, I really tried to break it down into what is it that we actually do as painters? And it really, it doesn't matter if you paint hyper-realistically, impressionistically, if you window shade, underpaint, direct paint, impressionistic, broken color. In the end, every painting out there is just an arrangement of, of puzzle pieces. And the only thing that can be applied to a two-dimensional canvas is using this very limited pigment is a, something of a certain shape that has a certain value that contains a certain hue or color and how they butt up against other puzzle pieces in a soft edge or a hard edge. That's it. That can be a, that can be a real challenge right there. Well, it definitely is. That's why a a solid actually training takes four or five years just to get the basics down. And so, uh, and then, and then that's in conjunction with working with your paints, where if you, 
say, took a, a white porcelain coffee cup. So if you took titanium white that you know, and held it up to it, it would probably be that color of the glass. But what about the highlight on the cup? on the glass. How do you hit that? So everything needs to be painted in relationship. So that's the second component. So that was what our school was based around was the reality of what we're doing, taking the three dimensional world um, with a full spectrum of light and trying to translate it onto a two dimensional surface using this very limited means called pigment. And from there we then the school, the, the whole school training grew. And so I took my training and I took, Brock took his training and I took my experience and I looked at what others had done in the past and I looked at what others were contemporaries were doing. And basically we tried to form the school we wish we had gone to. You've got young people who are coming up who have the the time and the commitment to be able to spend, you know, four or five years in training. But then you got the other side of the spectrum where you have people like me who are who are retired and and uh, we're just picking it up. You know, I know realistically I'll never be what a person that, that attends an atelier goes. But there's not enough. There's almost not enough time to to go through that rigorous process. So you just want to try to have fun uh, painting. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to find that happy balance there between a, a good art uh, art education. And being able to enjoy it. But that's a, I I think that's probably a very different objective than people who are going into the atelier. Well, but there's certain things, you know, if a student going through an atelier training, I'd say the bulk of what they learn, uh, the most important things that they learn, they learn in the first few weeks. You know, I, I, it's funny because you, you go through the, when I studied with WAC, I thought, okay, when I get to be a fourth year student, then, then he teaches me that secret glaze or that formula for that perfect medium. You know, and it's like, no, in the end, what I've come to realize is that for those, you know, for, for those that have mastered art, all they've done is mastered the fundamentals. And I think that's true probably in any discipline. The concepts that we teach at the ateliers are quite simple. Now, getting good at them, that takes time, but we just started our fifth year. We had new students coming in with five new students. And the first two, three days with what, the concepts that we explained to them, and they all came in with a lot of talent and good portfolios, but they hadn't heard these before. And it was kind of deer in the headlights. Within a week, they were doing already work that they could not believe they were doing just because they'd been shown some, some time-tested, simple principles of how you evaluate nature. So even students in our night classes who are, as you described, you know, they have other lives and different stages of life. It's amazing how quickly they catch on. And will they ever end up in a museum? I don't know, but um, maybe not. But they sure enjoy their painting more. And and, and the point you made is about just having fun. You know, where I want to be as an artist um, the, the, you know, the, my goals always grow. If, if I seem to accomplish what I thought was impossible 10, 20 years ago, well, the, the bar has been risen. Well, now I want to do something even harder, something even better. So if you're, if you're not going to be happy until you get good, you'll never be happy. So I look at it just, you know what, if I'm painting, it's a good day. One of the phrases that came out in the documentary, I don't want to give away all the spoilers. I want people to go see your documentary, but uh, was uh, this concept, <laughs> this idea of, of, of um, living on the edge of frustration. I thought that was really uh, interesting how you, you stated that. Where did that come from? Well, experience, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um but also, I've, you know, I have other interests in different disciplines I've studied in, and they're, they're all, they all collate. But really, um, I did a lot of sports, and, you know, unless you were really pushing yourself, you weren't getting better. Um, but I would, here's what I would find that I, painting by myself up in the North Woods, you know, you'd, every once in a while you'd have a breakthrough or whatever, and, and two, three, four paintings would just paint themselves. And then the next six months, year, two years, 
it was all I could do to just get the painting done. And it was so frustrating. It'd be depressing yeah, almost. And, and, and then also I would switch and then, and then I would turn out a number of solid pieces that just painted themselves again. And I, I just realized the pattern really, I, once I got where I was competent in whatever I'd been striving for after I'd done two, three, four in that, uh, in that st- not a style, but, um, you know, I accomplished that whatever technical thing I was trying to accomplish or visual um, aspect I was trying to capture. Then I'd get bored and I'd set a new challenge. I'd say, Hmm, I mean, I'm going to try this. That's interesting. Or I'd see something in nature or maybe something that an old master had done. It's like, how did they do that? Well, anytime there's a phrase or a saying, I think if you know, if you're going to learn anything new, you have to be prepared, prepared to, um, to fail. You know, you have to really, if you're going to go and try something new, you got to be prepared to suck at it. And, um, I recognize <laughs> that's what, that's what I was doing over and over. So with the students, we, we explain this is how it's going to go. And, and they're learning so much so fast and, and failing all the time because we're pushing them all the time. And that's when they grow the most. Um, but we, you know, it's, as a student, they, some of them, they, they, they get pretty down. And, and so that's where that phrase, you know, you want to walk on the edge of frustration, but don't fall over into depression. And so that's, that's <laughs> the one. Right, why. Yeah. Well, that's a good balance. I mean, you know, I, I think it would be rewarding to, to an extent to say, okay, yeah, I can do that. But I could also see that it would be boring to not ever go beyond that and try something uh, that pushes your abilities a, a bit further out. I think that we, we find satisfaction as humans in doing things uh, that challenge us. Right. No, and I think that's why it's so important. I, I, I revered the masters of the past and, and famous ones and obscure ones. They, they show us the way of what can be done. Now that it might be in a style or a genre that I have no interest in, but when you just look at what they were ability, their ability to decipher the visual world and translate on the canvas, one, it shows it can be done. These aren't, you know, it's not what we're trying to do has been attained. We have to just figure out how to do it ourselves. But second, they attained it at such a level that, it's pretty hard if you're honest with yourself to look at your work in the best of theirs and think I'm there, <laughs> you know, yeah. life, life isn't long enough. And so if you really want to, at the end of your life and you're in your rocking chair, looking back and you want to be able to say, you know what? I did my best. Um, that means you're probably got to work harder than you imagine each day. I appreciate your, your uh, thoughts on these things. It helps me because I'm, I'm relatively new. I've been studying it. Uh, applying myself to it for the last three years, I guess. But even there, it's not full time because, you know, life sure. life goes on. And of course, my objectives are different than, than someone that's trying to to make a, a living solely from from art. So it's just a little bit different. Sure. Uh, but I but, look, looking, looking into you a little bit, I, I found you, you've studied with some really, really fine, amazing artists. And uh, so that in itself is a huge wonderful opportunity that you've taken. There's something I've been working on for a number of, for almost a decade, actually, with and working with Joe McGurl and, and a few others. Um, basically, it was, it was a concept that I've seen that, again, this last century has been a tumultuous one, especially, you know, for everything, and including the art world. And, you know, the whole modernist movement, I think, is leg- obviously a legitimate movement in, when it when it comes to all that was going on in the world at the turn of the century. But in my mind, it was more of a, an experimental branch off the main trunk of Western art. And it just ended up overtaking everything to the point where we threw the baby out with the bathwater as far as the training, you know, what are the discipline? It's, you know, let me put it this way, you know, modernism hit all the arts, whether it was music, dance, poetry, literature, and they all experimented with new forms, which um, it was a, it was a time of experimentation, especially scientifically, but just in everything. But yet in all the other disciplines, it pretty quickly came back to the fact that, yeah, you might not want to be a classical ballerina and you really love Martha Graham and, and contemporary dance. They still trained as ballerinas, the you know, musicians, whether they wanted to do something uh, atonal still studied Bach and, and Mozart. And it was just in our, the visual arts that somehow 
the idea got st- stuck that training ruined originality. Uh, training provides the vocabulary. Exactly. You know, it's like if you say that you say you find the greatest musician, you know, just an inbred musician, they're just, they're just born with music and you give them a violin. That's not going to be music that comes out of that until they learn the craft of playing that violin. So our training, our school, you know, we, we're, we're not an art school. We say we're, we're a school that teaches the craft. Um, so anyway, it was um, in recognition of that, then basically what modernism in my mind did for pros or cons. I mean, if people like that, wonderful, but they threw away standards. They eliminated any idea of standards. And, and, and again, what, what's the difference between a, you know, a multimillion dollar piece, uh, like a Gaussian or something you see for a hundred dollars. And then there's just nothing to compare and contrast it with that kind of invaded our genre and 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 the people that decide and choose what good art is is primarily non-artists and and again they're often champions for us and and i i would never think to to disregard or put them down but you know most gallery directors or magazine editors or critics they don't paint and so it's really like a sportscaster, you know, I'm saying, well, that's, he's the best quarterback yet. Go ask Brett Farr or someone else. No, who do you think is the best quarterback? And they're going to have a whole different insight into that. So what I started noticing and, and other people that I really respected, uh, Jacob Collins and others, we just started chatting about it a, a decade ago concerning that. I really believe that we needed to take back the evaluation of what the standards were. And, and by we, I meant people that had painted professionally for 20, 30 years that had a solid training whose work, the other artists of that caliber respected. So we ended up coming up with this idea and I presented it to the Tweed Museum in Duluth and, and we were going to host a naturalistic painting show of artists and, and how you became part of this group was that Basically, I just called Joe a number of years ago. Joe, who do you think is the best painters in the world? And and where we agreed, we called them. Okay, great. Who do you think is the best painters in the world? And we just narrowed it down to the people that we really respected. We were going to have a show. Uh, it was all set uh, this next next summer, a uh, big international show, and then the COVID hit. Uh, <laughs> so right now it's on hold. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I remember listening to a a lecture by Clyde Aspavig and, and, uh, he, he was mentioning, uh, and he, and he showed examples of modern art. So he encouraged us to, to at least have an open mind. He wasn't saying that we should embrace it and become modern, uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, artists, but, uh, learn from the experimentation and some of the ideas that they, they create and then apply it to, to our art. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it would seem more, um, and it does, I don't want it in any way to sound like sour grapes, but I know, say, for instance, Richard Lack's experience um, and other painters of his generation, they, most galleries wouldn't take them and museums for sure would not show them. And they were never, you know, taught or held up by any university system. And so there was a real pushback it seemed like, or, um, I don't know, a prejudice amongst many of the modernists towards us when we just felt like you do your thing, we'll do ours. Let's, you know, but I think we should potentially be represented in the museums. I mean, you might see a YF here and there, not many other realistic painters. And throughout the last century, there's been, especially lately, just some phenomenal contemporary realistic art being done. And it's a shame. Oh, yes. It, it's it's not in the museums. So that was anyway, our, our, our chance was uh, what we thought was we would then at least throw in our two cents of what we felt were the artists we really respected versus the gallery directors who, if you went to a show where they advertised some, some of the finest, say, landscape painters, and you'd be like, well, those, yeah, that, those two or three, phenomenal. And then there'd be two or three, you'd be like, I don't know why they're here. And it's confusing to the public, and uh, especially. And... Um, And so anyway, we thought that was what we were going to attempt was to at least have a level of artwork that was admired by people that actually made it. I want to get back to your art because I got to tell you, when I first saw it, I was just 
it was a, a really visceral reaction to it. I mean, I just thought, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, the very first piece I saw is, is the, the one of the Electrolux vacuum cleaner. I want to talk about, you know, how you build this um, visual essay, if you will, and coming up with a, an idea like this, staging it and, and creating it. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is a funny, funny thing. That painting is probably the one more more people react to. It. It's just of a of an old, old Electrolux vacuum, and I guess uh, you know it's stemmed from you know once you are then you know after years of training, you, you're able to at least represent somewhat competently you know what you see before you, and 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 you know not you know here the other misconception I think about what we do is that we're just slavishly copying nature and, and that's by no means it's it's we're trying to edit it it's it's like if someone you know a great storyteller will encapsulate in in a few words you know an entire adventure or an experience that they had and 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 in, in, in a poetic way, and that's really what we're doing with the visual world. It's a it's a starting point because there's something in that element, whether it's a, a light effect, a subject, the way the light goes across the form, that just speaks deeper to me. And, and I imagine to other artists. And so it's it's not that I just want to slavishly copy them that entire scene. It's like I want to get rid of anything that doesn't help, uh, that hides maybe or, or distracts from that element so it's a real searching of what is it exactly and is it and how do you then translate that onto a two-dimensional surface so that you complete this image that does look like it has form and depth and light and yet it's you know it's a it's pigment on a canvas so it, it's a it's a it's a treasure hunt in a sense and so part of that then you can extrapolate out well then okay what what subject matter do you paint well i i found that what I thought would be interesting from in my mind and my imagination wasn't half as interesting as what I would notice just walking around outside or I would see in certain elements. And, and just the uh, creation is far more varied and interesting than what I can conceive of. I, I learned early on. And so it, it ended up with, and it, you, you almost can't help but sort of rehash the past and you know, part of it, you're just kind of learning how to paint and trying different things. And you fall in love with different artists and go through stages. But then I started finding elements and objects that just, I thought were beautiful. I couldn't get them out of my mind. And they were stupid objects, at least from a <laughs> painterly standpoint. I, I, I use this example in the, in the movie, but it was, it really was the pivotal moment in my life where I was just, a, I started collecting all these different balls from silver balls and ornaments and ball bearings and, and just marbles. And I, I pretty soon had a whole bowl of these things. And, and, uh, and I basically, I just, they, they haunted me in a way. And so I, I'll paint it and then I'll get it out of my system. And I can go back to painting real, real subjects, real art. And, and then did it turned out, I thought, fine, I was happy with it, put it aside. And when at that time, you know, and for most of my career, I'd work towards a, a big one man show every couple of years. And, and so when it came time to select the work that I was going to put into it, uh, I was, you know, I was interested in that. Cause I didn't think anybody would like a bunch of balls, but my wife was like, no, I, I love that piece. Let's put it in. Anyway, we did. And I could have sold it 20 times. And it was uh, a hint in the fact that, um, things that I'm most moved of or most personal, which I thought, well, who would be interested in that actually held the most interest it seemed to people. So that became kind of a starting point that if I just intellectually like something, well, that's fine. But if something just grabbed me deep, I would, I would really take the time to examine it. And, and many of the paintings that I guess it stood stood out for most people started as a collection of objects in the corner of my studio that I kind of glared at like, Oh no, here, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm collecting boxes to wine crates to, I don't know. There's a whole list of them, I guess. Styrofoam. I had a studio full of styrofoam for years. Um, but anyway, there was always some element that I, it was a, that I would then try to understand from within me that I was reacting to. And it is usually an artistic element. So the vacuum cleaner anyway was Heidi's mom had told her before we were married, if you ever find this model of Electrolux, which she had had as, as a, you know, her whole life, you got to buy it. It's the greatest one ever done. So we found one at a garage sale. 
it didn't really work that well. And over time, it just sat there. We were going to throw it away. I was throwing it in the dumpster. And Heidi's like, you know, that thing is cool looking. You should just hang on to it. And, yeah, uh, get did, two of them, it'll look like a, a jet pack, you know? <laughs> well, I did a little research on it. And, and actually, uh, Electrolux back in the 30s, and I never remember the gentleman's name, but it's the, it's the artist that really developed Art Deco. He designed... Uh, oh, wow. Uh, ocean liners and and trains and planes and and buildings. He was um, very pivotal in that in that time period for what he created. And Electrolux hired him to design this vacuum. So no wonder it stood out. It was beautiful. Um, it was a it was a piece of Art Deco artwork, really. So anyway, same thing. I'm just going to paint it, get it out of my system, and then we'll throw the thing. But that was the piece in the show that. Again, I could have sold 50 times. I had more, I had people crying about their memories of Electrolux when they were a kid or just liking the piece. Do you still have the piece? I mean, is it still in your collection? No, no, but it's in, it's in a really nice collection out in Boston. Okay. Well, no hope of me getting to see it up, <laughs> up close then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I digress. Well, there were two phrases that you used that really captured my attention because I, I, there's a similar process, I think, in all creative endeavors, filmmaking, for example. So you mentioned that, you know, uh, the editing process, you mm -hmm. know, the edit is important to to storytelling. I mean, it's kind of like we take that documentary that was done about you. If 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 the filmmakers had just put the whole thing out there, you would have had a it'd been tough to tell the story. But by cutting out and zeroing in on a central theme there the story became evident so that's the power of the edit i gotta throw the kudos out to to joe joe hawkins who um just a phenomenal filmmaker and very intuitive into what he chose i mean there was way too many hours of me talking <laughs> that was <were> filmed <laughs> and, and what that he was able to pull out a story uh was all kudos to him to be honest he um but from the filming the editing uh the questions that he'd ask I think everybody was so, so happily surprised and pleased with what he came up with. And so, uh, but it is, it's the same. We're all problem solvers. That's really what the creative endeavor is. And, you know, I'll have businessmen say, come to my show. So oh, I could never do that. And I try to point out, well, I, I bet in your own way you are, you know, as a successful CEO of a big company, you're, you're creatively problem solving all the time. It's the same really thing we're doing. It's just a different medium per se, different discipline, but. Well, you mentioned too, the power of, of observation, uh, observing what creation has. And it made me think, uh, I don't mean this to be a religious show by any means, but I think of how the creator uh, encouraged us as humans to be observant. You know, like he says, go to the ant and observe its ways or, or observe intently the birds, you know, <laughs> or look up at the yeah. stars, you know, th this, this idea of really looking closely at what's all around us. And that's what an artist does or uh, is, is really looking closely at what's around him. I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I, again, I, what's, what's in my feeble imagination or my mind compared to what's out in creation is just the, the staggering difference. And I think somebody said what you, you know, beauty, uh, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. And so if I can just see a little more truthful than I did the day before, usually that leads to something more beautiful in the work. And so the answers are all out there. I just got to get myself out of the way and I need to really focus in on, on a personal aspect. Okay. Out of all the beauties, why did that beauty jump out at me? And for whatever reason, it doesn't even matter. I, I've decided just, I'm going to explore that. And I learned so much about myself, about nature, about just what is beauty. You know, that's a whole nother show. I imagine that we don't yes. need to do great, but, um, you know, it, it's just there in front of us. Um, I guess, you know, I, I ended up, my wife's a big gardener also, and we had some rutabagas. And I think for me, one of my favorite paintings that I've done, um, which is usually people ask, what's your favorite painting? And it's like, well, it's usually the next one I'm going to do. But there's one that stood out called rutabagas where, it, you know, some dirty old rutabagas. I put them on the, on the stand to, to paint them. And, and just all of a sudden I just saw, the way the light interacted with them and, and it just, I was surprised what came out of that. And uh, it was kind of another pivotal lesson about you don't need lofty, lofty subject matter. You just need to 
you need to know that beauty is all about and just get yourself out of the way and your preconceived notions is what might or might not be ugly. And, and beauty is not necessarily a, a nostalgic, um, cutesy thing. It's, I you mean, know, you, you can see much more even among the mundane, uh, that beauty lurking in there. It may be the way the light shines, the texture that you see. Oh, yeah. Well, I think yeah. one of the most beautiful portraits I've ever seen was a painting in Della Roque did of his old, you know, his old mother. Not an attractive woman, I will say, but the way he painted her and, and from not just a technical aspect, but obviously the feelings I had for her just struck me deep far more than so many paintings of say a, a, of a beautiful woman which you know it's, that there's something to that too but it's, it's there's a deeper beauty to things that I think as an artist you want to you want to get past the superficial if you can want to back up a little bit about the the construction of the painting so you have an idea I'd, I'd like to know about the setup because there's there's clearly a setup in in your your paintings I mean there's just, I, I think about for example um, there's a painting I saw of yours where it's a, a bread rack and you've got all the loaves of bread sitting there that had to take I, I'd like to know about that process what do you go through when you have an idea like that, uh, to set it up before you begin to actually paint. Yeah, so I I, I paint everything from life. I, I, I only work from life, and and uh, I know that some a lot of artists don't, or they work in combination. That's that's fine. I just find, I guess the analogy I tell my students is that if I was instead of doing a painting but writing a biography of someone, would I rather work from a few recordings and try to extrapolate his life or just have that person at my side as I was writing the entire book so that I could, hey, what about this? Or tell me again about this aspect of your life. And, and over time, get to know them more and more personally. So I think all that would show in the final product. And I find that, well, especially in portraiture, but in any, everything, there's just, you live with an object. I and mean, we, <laughs> probably more than anybody in the world, we'll sit and stare at some rutabaga or vacuum cleaner for months on end or weeks on end. And who does that? You know, it's kind of crazy. But in that, you really learn it. And uh, so for the bread rack, that was an example where a friend of mine who has an antique shop just uh, was visiting him and that this old 19th century bread rack just jumped out. He had gotten it in France, I guess. But anyway, I, had, I bought it and, um, and then started, uh, again, there was this idea that this, this has potential. But then to, I was traveling to the, down to the Twin Cities, out um, towns, hours away, collecting from bakeries different kinds of loaves of bread, and just study after study after study after study as I arranged and rearranged them, and try to create a, a, a not only just a picture of bread on a rack, but a an, an abstract arrangement um, that was pleasing. You know, that's that's another misconception. I think that. To be an abstract painter, you you only paint you know just just abstract elements, no no story, no subject. But all the great paintings are in their basis abstract. Um, and, and like Black said, here's here's what you do. It doesn't matter how well you paint a portrait or a still life. If you hang that painting, say in a in a, in a, in a dark, dim, darkly lit room, and you just had someone walk by the door, glance in. Would that stop them in their tracks long before they could tell what the subject matter was or, or even any of the technical beauties you might have added? If it doesn't at that point grab their attention, it's not worth painting. And, and it's, it's just kind of like the music to a song. By the time you really listen to the words and you might realize those are the stupidest words I've ever heard for a song, you might love that song for all the abstract elements of the, of the chords and the music and harmonies and whatever else. And that's really how I look at a painting. So the subject is really just the icing of the cake. And it's the cake itself that I spend 95% of the time focused on and concentrating 
Uh, and so that painting, like I said, had many, 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 many studies of the arrangement of the bread in conjunction with how the light flowed um, and, and what kind of lights, you know, very sunny day, cloudy day. And so all those elements get mixed in until I create what I think is a pleasing arrangement, regardless of the fact that it's also a bread rack. And that, again, becomes the icing. I also, at that point, want to conventionally and beautifully paint. You're doing little studies, painting studies of that setup before you do your final uh, composition? I start with little thumbnail pencil studies and little value studies, especially on the larger pieces. That, that piece was probably five by six feet or thereabouts. Mm. <clears throat> and, and for so a piece that I'm, I'm going to invest, you know, six months or a year of my life, I, I definitely do a lot of studies beforehand. Smaller pieces, I might just set them up and, and go for it. But pieces such as that, yeah, I, I, thumbnails to little value studies to little color studies. And then with each study, I make tweaks and evaluations on, on the, the um, arrangement by the way I want it. So the other aspect of this I'm curious about is the title. Coming up with a title for a painting. Some people love to do it. Some people hate it. <laughs> some people just don't do it. To me, it's it's almost like uh, the painting is not complete until it's titled. What's your process for that? Yeah, that's the painful part. You're totally right. You know, you, if you get the right title with the right painting, it, it just allows the viewer to get in your mind or to see it in the way you, you know, maybe a little clear on how you're trying to present it. You know, some people are going to bunch of bread. Who cares? But if you title it correctly, they're like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. And then they maybe look at it that way. But, uh, no, that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not, every once in a while some title will pop in my mind but for the most part it's uh it, it's it's not a pretty process it doesn't usually end up oh well i didn't mean to bring up a painful subject but <laughs> uh well see living on the edge of frustration there you go yeah that, that, and that's where i cross the lines but um but yeah no it's uh that's, that's just part of the challenge i guess yeah how important is a frame to a painting, or should it even matter? I think it's vital. You're, you're presenting, you're presenting, and I don't mean it in a crass commercial yes. way, but you're mm-hmm. presenting a product to somebody, and the frame is part of that. A good frame will make the painting, and a bad frame will really dis- distract from it. We do all our own framing. We um we have, we have special knives made. We mill out our own stock. We have a, a really fine craftsman for years put them together. And then uh, we used to work with a really a museum frame shop to create finishes. And now my wife does it. She just fell in love with framing. And then so we tweak each frame to fit the painting. And it's amazing, you know, it, and yet it's not surprising. I mean, if you're working on a piece and just as you're coming up on the final stages of, of a painting, you know, you'll, You'll work up where you finally put one subtle little glaze or scumble or tweak one edge, and all of a sudden the entire thing pops forward and it completes itself. So it's it's not surprising then if you just alter the the tone or, or warm and coolness of your frame, where suddenly it it, it just lives well. It complements all that you put into that painting. So we're very particular uh, about the framing. I, I think it's vital. Very nice. It's one of those. It's one of those skills I would like to learn because to me, it's it's it is part of the finished product. I, sh- I hate mm-hmm. to use that. Let me try that again. I guess it is a product. I shouldn't be it ashamed. To say. Yeah, I don't. I, no, I, I'm trying no, that's to. A, that's a, there, there's something too about the whole artist for art's sake and and um, how we should be above selling our work and people don't get it. And, you know, a friend of mine used to say, you know, Michelangelo never picked up a brush or a chisel without a signed contract in hand. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, and, and Rembrandt and Ruben, Rubens was a phenomenal businessman. They, they didn't see commerce as being a negative thing. In fact, it, it pushed them to competition to do even better than their, you know, their, their co-patriots and, and, and fellow artists. And um, it's been a driving force, I think, for improvement. Now that doesn't mean you can paint to sell. I think that's, that never works. I don't think you can paint to please people. I don't see that works either. Um, what I tell my students when I'm in my studio, I don't think anything about business. It's just to me, I'm just going to bring this gut feeling or this visual imagery or whatever that has caught my eye to life. But once I sign it, then I don't want to be a prima donna or get too emotional about it where I never want to sell my work or whatever else. I, I, I force myself to okay, this is a product uh, and now I need to, you know, 
do focus enough on the on the business aspect to creatively market it so that someone might buy it so that I can feed my family and keep on painting because that's the reality of life. Um, so I separate it out very well, but it's become an element in my life, surprisingly, that I somewhat enjoy the business aspect. Like we referenced earlier, is like anything else can be a creative endeavor. And through that, through the commerce of my work, through selling my work to patrons, I have met some of the most fascinating, wonderful people uh, doing amazing things, you know, from CEOs to the Fortune 500 companies to entrepreneurs to sports individuals, you know, that I never would have met. But we come together through, um, through, for whatever reason, the love of a painting that I loved making and they, they loved enough to, to spend their hard earned money on it. And that became a, a huge surprising blessing because, um, uh, shows were very <laughs> nerve wracking in the early days, uh, just, um, just meeting people and so on. But, um, I don't see where it's, uh, this whole starving, you need to be a starving artist and, and people don't understand you and you need to not worry about selling your work. I, I want to be involved in today's culture and the things that people in culture appreciate, they spend money on. And so uh, it's kind of foolish, I think, to pride myself on not selling work or having low prices. I, it's not that I would, <laughs> I'm after the money, but the money, in a sense, is a measuring point, or it can be of, of value, at least in the perception of other people. And so there's nothing wrong with that. Well, I think there's there's satisfaction in somebody buying it. <laughs> so, wow, yeah. they liked it enough that they bought it, you know. <laughs> What a compliment. But see, I feel, I feel for that though. You know, years ago I had, I had a guy, it was an early painting that I did, not particularly great in my opinion, but he liked it and he offered me money for it and I refused to sell it. And so I have it sitting here in my office as a mockery to my stupidity. <laughs> I should have sold it. <laughs> Well, but then there's other sites where I, there are a few pieces out there that I release that I kind of cringe about. And there's kind of one funny story. And I, I hope whoever got this doesn't know which piece it was. But, you know, you, you, when, when you're young and you're, you're doing your best and, you know, like I say, certain pieces get out that maybe shouldn't have. Heidi and I were kind of reevaluating where all our work was. I was working with a bunch of galleries at that time. And I, I was like, where, okay, where is this one still? I remember that. That was horrible. I think about it. And, and we like, I don't know where that, oh no. no that, and it was with one of the galleries we worked with down in the Twin Cities. And it's like, oh my God. If the wrong person saw that, they would hate me forever. I mean, they would just, you know, that would be it. Larson's a lousy artist in their mind. So we got in the car and drove straight down there to go get it. <laughs> we walk into the gallery and the director, she's like, she lights up. You won't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> Someone an hour before had bought that painting. So I, I apologize to whoever that was. It, it wasn't a good piece, but um, so I, I, I'm pretty careful on. But it made you know, them both. happy, right? So, and well, you know, I guess so. So, uh, you know, for even at this stage of been painting for 40 years, I, I'm sure it's only two or three out of four paintings that I do that end up in a, um, in the public's eye. I, I, every year I do have a kind of a ritual burn. <laughs> I'm getting rid of old paintings. <laughs> So, Do you ever scrape a, a painting and, and reuse it, or you just start start for fresh? Uh, it it kind of depends. I, you know, that underpainting can be a real uh, problem years down the line. It shows through where I'm not sure of the oil content of the underlayers. So smaller pieces that are just for like landscape studies and so on, I'll paint over and over. But um, the bigger pieces, I usually I'm worried about the craftsmanship of it. And I'll start fresh. Yeah, the qu the quality is is important. I mean, we want to give the best value to our customers and they're buying something that they, they hope will, will, they'll be able to keep and hand down generation after generation. So, yeah. Yep. You have to have integrity. Well, you know what? The other thing about marketing is sometimes um, people are looking for that formula or recipe to marketing. And I don't know if this is true with you or your experience and I would like to hear it, but you know what I found with my business was there wasn't really a formula. People bought from people they liked, people bought from people they trusted. And the way they found out about you is you got out there and you were introduced or you made yourself known <laughs> in some way. And that basically was the essence of marketing was, you know, people buy from people they like and they buy the things that they need. 
or want. It's, so it's, it sounds so basic, but it, it, it is a profound truth, I think, to what you said. I, I, that's what my experience. I, I, my thought now is I don't want anybody to buy any of my work unless they really love it. I mean, one is I put so much into each piece. I don't want it to end up in someone's attic or in their side room because they really didn't like it. Or you know, I, I want it to be appreciated. And and yet, you, I, I, you know, I, you can't talk someone into it. I, either they're going to like it or not. And in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy meeting them and shake their hand and have a nice little connection, hopefully. And, you know, it just, it is what it is. It'll, if you do good work and get it out there, like you say it, it'll find a home. Do you sell primarily through galleries or do you sell direct? Primarily direct. I mean, I work with some really fine galleries and I have for years, but we just started early on, my wife and I, where we had the opportunity through some, I guess you'd say some wealthy, you know, old money established people in the twin cities to have a show in their home, a couple of them. And that introduced us to the, you know, the business leaders and, and, and so on of, of, of the twin cities. And they formed a core group and, and it, that show grew from location to location until eventually I partnered with a gallery, but it was in the sense that they let me take over their space. And um, we dictated pretty much everything and ran the shows. It, it grew to where I, I it, at the height, I'd probably have guest list of 3,500 people and hundreds of clients. And, and so that show just became where the gallery uh, that I worked with, I uh, ended up, the gentleman retired. And in in the location, the, the gallery, it's the oldest mall actually in America. It's a very nice, high-end, beautiful mall. Um, the The owner of that also became a client. So he started reaching out to me and we had conversations about, well, this one store is leaving in October. I can rent that to you. And great. And so I basically created a pop-up gallery and I had a staff that I'd work with and we'd put out a catalog and do all the marketing and we did it all ourselves. It would usually go great. The show would hang for two, three weeks. We'd sell most everything. I'd have enough money to turn around and come up north and I could just paint for a couple of years without worries. And, um, but in the meantime, I became a big fish in a small pond. No one, no one knew about me. So then I was, I worked more and more with galleries out East and out West and New York and such, just so I could become more of a player. They would, you know, part of their 50% was the fact that they were then promoting. So I couldn't afford to do that on my own. So I, I, I try to strike a balance these days. And of course, here we are in the midst of a pandemic. So people are more cautious about, uh, venturing out. How do you see that affecting the market right now? Well, surprisingly, uh, this has been a pretty good spring for, I think, a lot of the artists. Um, you know, 2008 smacked us, like it smacked everybody aside the head. But it, oh, that, was, that was awful. Was so, yeah. so slow to come back. And um, it really wasn't. It's funny because um, I, I, I chat with a lot of gallery owners and other artists and it wasn't really until the turn of this year that things kind of were taken off. And then the COVID hit and we're like, Oh no, here we go again, 2008 all over. But I think people were stuck in their homes looking at bare walls going, Hmm, I think we need a painting. <laughs> so actually it's been a pretty good spring. Um, where this goes from now, I was going to have a big show this fall. I haven't had one for probably eight years of a different, well, because of 2008, to be honest, I had a several and it just diminishing returns. But I was, I've was i got a, a huge body of work, and um, I think and I'm hoping in the spring maybe I can do it. But, yeah, right now everything's a little bit on hold. I'm part of a, a two-man show at Collins Galleries that will open at the end of the month um, with Paul Seaton, a phenomenal uh, English landscape, or uh, still a painter. But other than that, it's just kind of, I'm just still working and building up a body of work. Nice. Well, I like to talk about tools. I always love looking in someone's tool shed and seeing what they've got, what they use. Do you mind talking a little bit about what you like to paint on and what kind of tools and that you use sure. to, to create your marks? Sure. Yeah, it's pretty, it's settled into a pretty basic, but I, I do kind of laugh. I, <laughs> I work with a, with a limited palette of about 28 colors. <laughs> a limited palette of 28 colors. I like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, you know, I, I, so my painting methodology, again, I, 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 I fell in love with outdoor figure painting, uh, but then in the, in the winters, you know, that, that doesn't work so well up in Northern Wisconsin. And so I, you know, worked with still life and 
which is kind of funny in, in my memory because I could not paint a still life to save my life at, at Lax. And two, I had two main thoughts the day I graduated and was walking down the stairs for the last time. I was thinking, wow, on my own, this isn't going to be good. Two, I never have to paint another still life as long as I live. And uh, so the fact that I'm kind of known for that now is ironic. But so I use the same palette. I uh, I approach, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, my still lifes that are more refined start out very bold, very broad. Um, so my approach is pretty similar of breaking nature down into its components and translating them. Um, I work on uh, either dye bond panels for the smaller pieces and studies or That's the aluminum care. panels, right? Correct. Yeah. They're just so convenient. So nice. And then um, I think I've been working with Claussen's linen for 30 years. Um, I just, it just works for me. It's a high quality canvas, the, the, the way the texture is, the, you know, whatever the, the primer they put on there, the way I like the way it, the paint uh, is applied to it. And so that's you, really, are you it, using like a single prime or, or double prime oil primer? You know, or? 13, 13 double prime is a canvas I use yeah. for everything under probably 30 by 40. And then it's, it's a bit of a thinner canvas. It's a finer weave canvas. And so then uh, I, I have stretched large canvases that I've torn the corners and so on. So then I bump up to their 15 double prime, which is a heavier weave. And then if it's going to be a refined still life, a larger piece, then I'll, I'll apply another layer of ground on it to, to create a smoother tooth. Um, but pretty much, yeah, those are the two canvases I use uh, forever now. I uh, use high from Windsor Newton and uh, some, uh, let's see, what and I think, uh, you know, from Holbein to Old Holland, um, you know, I kind of mix and match to find what I think is the right hue. You know, it's, as we all have noticed, you can buy five tubes of cadmium red and mm, they don't really look like each other. So I've kind of got a collection. They use the same oils in their in their grinding process. So they, they work well together. And, and um, I'm, I'm not against, uh, I, probably each year I try four or five, six new colors that come out and maybe one sticks to the can panel for a while, or I'll kind of experiment with what that specific color can do. And if I do have a subject that that calls for it, I I'm, I don't hesitate to to put it out on my can or my um, palette. I, I have no, I don't create strings of color. Or there's no formulaic Munson approach to how I use color. I just I I train myself to see color, and I look down and I. I just see what I need to do on the palette. Um, I don't really think, you know, red and blue makes purple. I just grab and, and mix intuitively in a sense. Yeah. And I would think the only other thing is, is the, the transparency of the color. Cause uh, it would seem to me that you're using some glazes on, on some of the still life. No, that's true. I, in fact, I, I use them on the outdoor pieces too. I, one of Black again, he was such a, an important figure in, in mid century painting and, and later 19th century or 20th century. And the fact that he was so well versed, he was a, he was in the best way that Jack of all trades. He was, Rubens was his favorite artist. He had studied under Gamma, who had studied with the American Impressionist. So he was an Impressionist. He had delved into the Venetian process. He was a Renaissance man is probably a better way to say it. And so he passed all that methodology and technique training on to those of us that were interested in it. And, and, and after I graduated, I used to even work on some of the underpaintings for his pieces. So I got to be even more involved with different techniques from different eras. And so, you know, paint, you got you know, 28 colors or less. You know, if you mix a red and a blue together, you get a certain purple. If you glaze it, that same color over a, a lighter tone, you obviously get a different purple. If you glaze it over a different color, you get a completely different color. If you glaze it over a darker color, there's a scumble, you create a pearlescence coolness. So by combining techniques, you know, along with broken colors side by side, you get a whole different thing. And so most of my paintings, whether they're you know, it was seemingly thick painted impressionistic broken color often have a lot of glazing or underpainting to them. And, and a lot of my still lights that look you know, very refined and finished, um, if you look close, have broken color. So thinking, thinking broken color into a glaze that you prepared with a certain underpainting creates 
effects and colors, you, it's just amazing that it's the only way to get certain colors. And, and so it's, a, it's an ongoing exploration of what can you do with these pigments. And it, it just oh, yes. never that. It, it, it never, you never, you never learn it all. You don't even scratch the surface. No. Well, sometimes I, I become enamored of the, of the medium itself. Forget about the subject because, <laughs> because the yeah. paint is so beautiful, you know? That's when you get in the flow, and it just and, and I think in a way sometimes that's that's what I call getting out of the other way, where you just see these colors and values that come together in a beautiful musical song, and, and and the fact that it ends up becoming a face or a tree or whatever else is secondary and not as important as just this this beauty, this this, this amazing coming together of value and tone and color. Um, so, well. Let me wrap it up. I've already taken it longer than I told you that I would, so I've become a liar, <sighs> as, as often I do. We're I'm sorry. Fun. We're fun. It is. I like this. This is so, it is fun. But before we go, perhaps you could let everyone know where the best places to go to find out about you and your art. I think Joe's got the documentary on his website, Joe Hawkins Films. Yep. Uh, and then, um, yeah, I got my website, JeffreyTLarson.com, and the school is Great Lake Academy of Fine Art.com. So if they're curious, if you're curious, please take a peek. Very nice. Well, Jeff, it has been a delight talking with you on The Artful Painter today. Well, Carl, I feel the same. This was pretty painless. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad it was painless. <laughs> oh. Episode number 46 of The Artful Painter featuring Jeffrey T. Larson. What an honor to speak with him. I encourage you to go and check out his website. And there you can see examples of his beautiful art, including his outdoor paintings and his indoor paintings. They are absolutely beautiful. You don't want to miss it. I'll have links to Jeffrey Larson's uh, website, as well as the Great Lakes Academy of Fine Art as well as Joe Hawkins' documentary about Jeffrey Larson. They will be in the blog post as well as the show notes for this episode. I'd like to share with you some of the feedback that the Artful Painter has received. This one comes from Ben Obecti. He says, wow, I just found your podcast. It was very easy to follow and listen to all the conversation with the greatly inspirational artist, Brian Rutenberg. Just subscribe to the channel and I will listen or watch the next ones. So that message came through YouTube. As you know, many of you do listen to this podcast uh, through YouTube, and occasionally I do have a video version, though not very many. The next email comes from Cindy, and I know I'm going to mispronounce this, Agathocleus. I'm sorry, Cindy. I wish I could do a better job pronouncing your name. But anyway, she wrote a very kind email. She says, I recently found your podcast, and I enjoy it very much. I feel that it is done at a very professional level. Great work. The questions you always ask are about the things that I would ask myself, and discussions are always full of meaning and depth, and your warm manner makes it sound like an intimate discussion between friends. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for that. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that Cindy became an associate producer on The Artful Painter, and what that means is she made a contribution. She made a contribution uh, to the show, which is very much appreciated. Another message came in via YouTube. This comes from Little Lily. She says, great interview. I have learned so much. I am an older beginner and kind of lost my way because of the COVID depression stuff. This has really helped to encourage me to get back to my love for learning how to paint. Amanda Lovett is an awesome artist. Thanks for sharing. So she left that comment on the episode featuring Amanda Lovett. So thank you. I appreciate that, Lily. The next one comes from Sarah Burns. Uh, she has a nice uh, YouTube channel herself, and I encourage you to check that out. It's Sarah Burns Studio. But anyway, she says, as soon as I press play, I was instantly relaxed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that. That's in connection with the episode featuring Dan McCall. And then Kim Laurier, Fine Art, comments uh, on the uh, uh, Bill Anton episode. Very grateful for this interview. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Well, hey, thank you, uh, Kim. I appreciate that feedback, too. 
The next email is a scam alert. <laughs> I get these all the time, but uh, this this email came in through my website, and it had this very compelling subject line. It reads like this: "Error on your website," and it's from a person named Carrie Miller. And the message of the email says, "It looks like you've misspelled the word." Burge on your website. Now that's the artist, uh, the author, Harrison Burge. So uh, for one, they put that name in a quote and it's not misspelled. So I'm thinking, hmm, boy, that's a, there goes the alarm bells off in my, uh, my skeptical mind, right? But anyway, they're claiming that I've misspelled the word. And then they continue, I thought you would like to know, and then a little emoji smiley face. Silly mistakes can ruin your site's credibility. I've used a tool called, and I'm just, I'm not going to tell you the name. I'm just going to say blah, blah, blah. (laughs) Uh, But they continue in the past to keep mistakes off my website. And it's signed, Carrie. Well, let me tell you, Carrie Miller is a complete and absolute uh, scam artist. This is a total scam and you need to be aware of it. If you have a contact me form, on your website, sooner or later, you're going to get a similar message. Now, it's not always from a person named Carrie Miller. It may be some other name, but it's almost invariably uh, labeled or, or sent in the same format. And they'll have some random name or, or some random word claiming that it's misspelled. And usually they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. They'll have you looking all over the website looking for this thing if you're not careful. But it is a complete an utter scam. Stay away. So always be cautious. I appreciate everyone for sharing your feedback with me. Well, even the scam artists, because that can be educational in a way. But anyway, if you want to leave me an email, all you have to do is go to carlolson.tv slash contact. I'd like to acknowledge the associate producers of The Artful Painter. These are people who give financial support to the show with their generous donations. And uh, I have two new uh, donors. I've already mentioned Cynthia. She uh, made a donation. But also Jill uh, Rufato. Uh, You may know her as Jill Rufato uh, Steenheis. She was featured in a previous episode of this podcast. And I'm very grateful for uh, her support of the show. So that brings the total number of associate producers for the year 2020 of The Artful Painter to 17 people. And some of them are multiples. They do this on a regular basis. And I'm very grateful to them. I may start calling the repeats (laughs) executive producers. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I do appreciate their generosity. So here's the entire list. Cynthia Agatha. Cleus, uh, Kelly Bailey, Alan Bloom, Sandra Shook, Jeffrey Eichhoff, Richard Husband, Brent Kimber, Deb- Deborah Martin, De- David McNeil, Jonathan McPhillips, Jim McVicker, Margaret Miller, Debbie Mueller, uh, Jill Rufato, Frank Wash, Shirley Williams, and Colleen White. I would like to thank each and every one of you. Your generosity does make a huge difference in the production and support of The Artful Painter. If you would like to join the growing ranks of supporters of The Artful Painter, please visit carlolson.tv and click on the Donate tab. Well, that brings us to the end of this show. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening. I'll see you all in the next edition of The Artful Painter.
on the TV.